Well, good morning, Revival. Good morning. My name is Joey McKernan, and I serve as the executive director at Abide Omaha. And a lot of you guys have served. Who served at Abide in here? A lot of people look forward to working with a lot of you guys in the uh, upcoming months. I've known Alex for a long time, and uh, he asked me to come share. And I said, I always love coming and sharing. I just want to let you guys know my dad, before I got up here, uh, well, back up, my wife is 38 weeks pregnant, so we're really excited for that. But if she gives me the look, like baby is coming, I'm just going to take off. Is that okay? And then Alex is just going to have to come up here and make something up. I got the word right here. You got the word? Okay, good. I love it. Uh, but again, just glad to be here. Uh, I love this church, and I love the word revival. I love that word because it's close to our heart at Abide. We say Abide, we want to see the church known for change. And we want to see the church as the movement that we believe God has called it to be. And so I'm excited to share. I'm excited to see what God is going to do. But I want to pray really quickly. And, and I know preachers and speakers get up here and they say pray. And a lot of times they use it as a transition into the song or, or after the song. But I really want to pray because I believe that this morning God is going to do something incredible in our hearts. I believe that God is going to, going to do something in this church, in this, I don't even know what you call this. What is this? A, a, a pavilion. Okay, is that what this is called? I love this because the church is a movement. It's not a building. It's the people. And so I'm going to pray for us. But if you could do this, could you just hold your hands out real quick for me? Just like this. Some of you guys are like, I don't know what this is. Some of you guys are new. That's okay. But what this is signifying is like, ooh, we need to switch. Are we good? Good? This is signifying that, God, we are ready to listen to your word. God, we are ready to hear your voice. We're ready to hear your spirit. So, God, we just say right now, Lord, God, we're silent before you. God, we're listening. God, right now, God, we leave everything at the door. God, we leave everything Lord, outside these walls. God, we're ready to listen to what you are saying. God, your word is powerful. Your word is everything. So Holy Spirit, come into this place. God, speak to us like never before. God, Lord, I am not speaking today. God, you are speaking. So God, speak. Lord, I can sense your presence right now. God, I thank you for the church. God, there is nothing, you said this, there is nothing that can stop the church because you're behind it. God, we love you. It's in your name. Amen. I grew up with a best friend. We're still best friends, by the way. His name is Jesse. And uh, who has a best friend in here? Someone you can talk to, go to, uh, laugh with. You got all these memories. Me and Jesse, we grew up together together. Uh, we didn't plan to grow up together, but we did because our parents were best friends. And so <clears throat> we didn't have a choice. We were just stuck with each other. And I remember when we were in middle school, uh, we were at this conference, and they were doing this contest of who was the longest time of being a best friend. And at the time, it was 14 years because we were 14 years old. And uh, me and Jesse go up on stage, and there's two other girls, and they were best friends. And I remember they were asking these girls, they were like, oh, why, why were you guys best friends? And she was talking about how they listen to each other and they love each other and they're for each other. And they asked me and Jesse, they said, why are you guys best friends? And we said, I don't know. We just have been. Ever since we can remember, we were best friends. And uh, that year, we go into high school. And me and Jesse are walking down the hallway one day. And we're going to history class, which at Bellevue East, we got any Bellevueites in the house? All right, zero. I love it. Bellevue West, we got some Bellevue. Hey, come on, represent, come on. We got two people in the house from Bellevue. We already talked about Bellevue earlier, but we're at Bellevue East. We're walking down the G-Wing, and at Bellevue East, the G-Wing is long, and we're talking about whatever. We're talking about life. We're talking about what, you know, whatever high school kids talk about. And earlier that day, I made a mistake, and I said something to somebody that I shouldn't have. 
It's high school life, right? You just make mistakes. And I'm walking down the hallway with Jesse. I got my backpack, and we're walking. And all of a sudden, I hear, and I think there's something in the ceiling because it just sounds like little taps. And fast forward a little bit. Those were footsteps. I'll get to that here in a second. But I thought it was something in the ceiling. So I immediately look up like there's something wrong. And this kid that I had said something that I shouldn't have said was full out sprinting at me. He had his eye on me. And he comes and he just, boom, kicks me in the back. It's okay to laugh. It happens. It's high school. I got my backpack on. Immediately, I just fly forward and I hit my head on the ground. And I have no idea what's happening. If you've ever been in a fight before or been blindsided, you have no clue what was happening. And as I'm on the ground, I'm like disoriented. I have no clue. And he's on top of me, like, don't you ever say that to me again. Blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, it is what it is, you know? And I'm listening. But in the back of my head, I thought, where the heck is Jesse? <laughs> we were walking together. Where is he? And in the corner of my eye, while I'm on the ground, I see him taking off. He is running away. And I'm like, what? I roll into uh, my history class, literally roll on the ground. Because if I can get to my history class, I'm safe because my teacher's there. Funny uh, side story. Actually, my teacher later on, years later, said, do you remember that time that you rolled into my class? I was like, I do. It's like, what happened there? I was like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. But I was like, man, where did Jesse go? We're supposed to be bros. We're supposed to be clo like close, and we're supposed to be brothers. Funny story. We had a similar situation, and I left Tim. And it, I'll tell it to you guys later on. But, but again, I'm on the ground, and I'm looking, at, and I can see him in the corner of my eye taking off. I'm thinking, man, I thought he was a close friend. By the way, he's still a close friend, and we still laugh about that story to this day. But we kind of have those people in our life, right? We have the core people, right? We have those people that we grow up with, that we love, that we have stories with, that we have memories with, that you've cried with, that you've laughed with, that you've talked to till 2 a.m. in the morning, right? But then we have these people over here, what we're going to call today crowd people. And crowd people in our lives are acquaintances, Right? They say happy birthday, to you on, happy birthday to you on Facebook, right? And they're like, oh, you know, hope your kids are doing well, and we should get together soon, knowing that you'll never get together. You know those people? Okay, let's just be honest. And the only time they get together with you is when they're selling you a pyramid scheme. You know what I'm talking about? Okay, we'll keep moving on, because some of you might be in pyramid schemes right now. It's fine. It's fine. No judgment here. But you get those people, right? There are crowd people and there are core people. And here's the truth about Jesus's life. And when we walk through the gospels, you see, there was core people in Jesus's life. There were core followers of Jesus and there were crowd followers of Jesus. There were people that said, you know what, Jesus, we're going to be all for you. We are going to give everything we got. We are going to leave our home, leave our families. We are going to give everything for you. But then there's the crowd people. And the crowd people, the crowd, love Jesus when it's easy. The crowd people love Jesus when it makes sense for them. The crowd people love Jesus when he did the miracles, but the moment Jesus went to the cross, they were nowhere to be found. Today, we're going to be asking ourselves and looking within ourselves, are we core or are we the crowd? There's a story in the Bible. We have the first verse up here. In John chapter 6, verse 53, I got music sheets flying at me. And it, what's funny about Jesus' life is as Jesus is walking through the countryside, People would start following him, and they would, he would create these giant crowds because he was doing miracles, and he was doing all the things that Jesus was doing, and, and people loved it. But what's so funny about Jesus is when Jesus caught all these crowds, he would turn around and teach something difficult. And the question I believe Jesus was trying to get at was, are you actually following me, or are you just a fan of me? Are you actually all in for me? 
Or are you just kind of watching me? And this is the first story we run into, John chapter 6, verse 53. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father so that one who feeds on me, that's a weird statement by the way, will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. He said to them, while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. On hearing this, many of the disciples said, here we are, here's the crowd. This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? Funny that we live in a society that hates to be offended, by the way. We all avoid being offended. But Jesus, every time the crowds and the big, the big groups of people came, he would teach something difficult. He says, does this offend you? If it does, that's actually maybe not bad because we're getting to the truth. Are you a fan of me or are you a follower of me? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of spirit and life. Next verse. Oh, sorry. That's it. Okay. I thought it was longer. Okay. After this verse, Jesus asked Peter all the... So so Jesus gives this teaching. And then what happens is the crowd leaves. It says many of his disciples took off. They said, we can't do this. It's too hard. It's too difficult. We're not going to sit longer to learn more of what you're trying to say. I just, it's not helping me. I'm gone. And then Jesus would turn to Peter and say, and his, his core disciples and would say, are you going to leave too? And Peter says, where would we go? You have the words of eternal life. In one book, he says, we've left everything for you. Where would we go? You see the dichotomy of two different groups. One group says, you know what? Where would we go? We've given everything for you. We are all in for you. We will do whatever it takes. Whatever you say, I'm here. I'm not going anywhere. If you say jump, I will jump. If you say serve, I will serve. I will do anything for you. And the moment it gets hard, though, for the crowd, they take off. The crowd and the core. You see, what's so funny about the crowd is they come in and they come out through the stories of the Gospels. But if we we fast forward the story of Jesus and Jesus is on trial, it wasn't the Romans that put Jesus on that cross. If you remember the story, it's the crowds that are chanting, crucify him. Three days before that, they were palm treeing palm treeing him. I don't know if that's a verb. I don't think it is, but we're going to make it a verb today. They were palming, right? They were doing the palm branches. They were saying he was the Messiah. He was the king. Three days later, they were chanting, crucify him. Do you see how quickly they turned? When Jesus quit serving them, they said, oh, I got to get out of here. You see, you have two different groups, the crowd, and the core. There's a couple lessons we learn in this story. Number one, the core believe that Jesus is enough. We live in a society, especially in Christianity, where it's like Jesus plus security. I need Jesus, but I also need an investment portfolio so it makes me feel safe and I feel good and I have everything put together. Oh, I need Jesus, but I also need these things in my life. I need Mm -hmm. Jesus plus. And the problem with the crowd is that they wanted Jesus, but Jesus was only an eighth of their life. The other seven eighths they wanted to keep. And the moment when Jesus started saying something radical, they were gone. Because Jesus was saying, look, I'm not an eighth of your life. I'm all of your life. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm not willing to give that up. I can't give it all up. 
You see, to people who are core, Jesus is everything. Jesus is in their family. Jesus is in why they do things, why they spend money, why they give, why they get up in the morning. Jesus is everything. And in the story, Peter says, where would we go? We've given up everything for you because you are enough for me. You're enough. I think of the rich man, Matthew 10. Jesus connects with the rich man. The rich man comes up to him and he's like, Jesus, I want to be all in for you. And Jesus says, have you loved your neighbor? Yes. Have you followed the commandments? Yes. Have you done all these things? Yes. And Jesus says one more thing though. I want you to sell everything, give it to the poor and follow me. And the rich man walks away sad. It wasn't even about his riches, by the way. It wasn't even about that he had a lot of money. It was that he wanted Jesus plus his riches. He wanted to do his riches how he wanted to. He didn't want to give that over. See, a lot of us, we want Jesus plus. We, he's just a piece of what we do. Sunday morning tends to, and it can start to become just a thing we do. But it's like, no, people who are close to Jesus, like, no, it's an everyday thing. It's a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, 365, every minute. Jesus is everything to the core. A couple years ago, my buddy uh, had a bachelor party. All my friends are, tend to be Christians, and so Christian bachelor parties are, you gotta, you gotta get really creative, you know what I mean? Because it's like, what do you do? <laughs> you just like do a Bible study and like, you know, so excited for you to get married, and then you go to bed. No, like, what do you do? So one of my friends, we went skydiving, and then my other friend, we went cliff jumping. So we just do like crazy things, and we were in Kentucky, in the hills of Kentucky, <laughs> and uh, it was like a 45-foot cliff. It wasn't super high, but it makes you a little nervous. You know, your hands are sweating. And um, one of my friends gets up there, and they were like, you have to jump out because there were bushes and trees. And like, if you jump, if you just like step and fall, you're going to hit trees. You know what I mean? And um, I was like, good to know. And, and so you got to really jump, you know? Like, you got to, oh, you got to really jump. I jump, friends jump. But then my friend gets up there, and he's just not the most you know, courageous person. He probably sees this. It's true. Like, you know, he needs a little extra push. He needs a little encouragement, you know. And so he finally gets the courage. Anybody been cliff jumping, by the way? Okay. You know how you like stand up there, get a little nervous? No, that's just me. Okay. So he's a little nervous. We're like, just jump, man. Just jump. And he finally gets the courage to jump, but he doesn't go all the way in. And he just kind of steps off and just falls straight down catches his feet on the trees and the bushes, falls forward, <laughs> hits the water. He was fine. He was fine. But it was like, we told you, if you don't go all in, it's a mistake. We got it on camera. It was great. And we love it. That's what makes a great bachelor part is if someone doesn't hit their head on something, it's not a win. And um, it was like, you got to go all in, right? But he didn't go all the way in. He held back. Because he, he wanted the security, he wanted the safety, but that's what ended up hurting him in the long run. He held back. And I think sometimes that's what we do. We hold back. Jesus is saying, look, I need your radical self. I need all in. But we're like, ugh. But not that. That's going to hurt. That's going to make me uncomfortable. That's going to make me, I've never been there. I've never served that person. I've never talked to them. I've never given that much money away. Like, again, we hold back. And we think it's helping us, but it's actually hurting us in the long run. Because the core of Jesus, those core followers, they give it all away. Because Jesus is all they need. So the first lesson we learn here is that Jesus is enough. The second one is that the core, they just keep moving forward even in the most difficult times of their life, even when they have terrible things happen in their family, even when life doesn't seem like it was supposed to, or the, again, the core keep moving forward. We look at Peter. How many times did Peter fall? I'm losing count. I mean, he fell all the time. He denied Jesus three times. Again, he was the one that said, I'm radical, but it wasn't necessarily his failure that kept him from being the core. It was that 
he continued to move forward with Jesus. I think of the end of Luke and the start of Acts when Jesus reinstates Peter. It's one of my favorite stories in the Bible. Because Peter comes back to Jesus and Jesus is like, I gotta, you got to get back in the game. And he could have very well just turned away and went back to fishing and is like, I gave it my best shot, I'm out. But he said, no, I'm going to continue to serve you. I'm going to continue to move forward. I'm going to continue to try and learn and to move. They never stopped. They kept learning, kept moving forward, and ended up giving their lives to the gospel. There's a story, uh, Lone Survivor, who's seen the movie before, Lone Survivor, okay? Marcus Luttrell, there's, he's kind of the star in the, the movie, four Navy SEALs, Operation Red Wing. They're over in the Middle East, there's four Navy SEALs, they go into this battle, and they end up getting ambushed. It's this heroic story of four Navy SEALs who are fighting for their lives. They claim there's, I think there's a picture of them here. They claim there's 20 to 30 militia uh, soldiers that are literally pressing them basically against this mountain. And they're fighting for their lives. Three of them ended up losing their life, getting hit with RPGs and just a firefight. Marcus said he basically gets pushed back to the mountain so far, and they push him off the mountain, essentially. He ends up falling off the mountain, off the cliff, breaks his back, takes multiple rounds to the, just the body, legs. I think he broke his hand. There's just so many injuries. And he said he's, as he was lying there in the ditch, he said, I got to keep moving. I cannot just be here. He said what he would do was he would take a rock and he would throw the rock forward. And he's like, if I can just crawl to that rock, I know I can get there. And he would. And then he would pick the rock up and he would throw it. And he would crawl and then he would throw it again and crawl. He did that for two and a half miles. It got him to the village that he was ended up saved in. And some of you here right now feel like you fell over a cliff. <laughs> feel like you're just, you are just trying to keep going. But you feel numb because you got so many responsibilities. You got so many, you got the kids and you got the job and you got the rent and you got the economy and you got the stress and you got, we all have those things. I'm like, man, I want to follow Jesus like the core, but I'm feeling like I'm on the side of a mountain numb and I can't move. But I'm telling you, just take a step. Just take a step. That's what following Jesus from a radical perspective looks like. You just keep moving. You just continue to serve. You continue to love. You continue. Just keep moving. You just keep moving. Keep serving. Keep loving. Keep giving, investing in people. You just keep moving. And what happens is being radical becomes your lifestyle. I preach at a lot of like youth conferences and stuff like that, but I always talk to a lot of the young people because they have these spiritual highs. They have these moments with Jesus, but I'm telling you, that mountaintop experience, I always tell them, you will fall off the side of that mountain. You will. And you will be tired, and you will be undisciplined, <laughs> and you will, you will lose it, that fire. But it's not about the fire. It's can you continue to take one radical step forward every single day? That's all that Jesus is asking us to do. So number two, the core is asking us, or Jesus is asking the core to keep moving forward. But the last one, and this is one of my favorite, is Jesus says, look, I need you to pick your cross up daily. Here's the text. This is another moment, by the way, that Jesus is literally walking and crowds are following him and another, if you may, come to Jesus moment where he's like, no, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's talk. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves. It's very against our society. Everything's about ourselves these days, right? 
He says, deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. And a lot of you, if you've grown up in church, you know this verse. But here's the deal about this verse. It is probably one of the most radical verses in the whole Bible. Jesus literally turns around and says, look, if you want to follow me, you've got to die. You see, the cross wasn't some cool little image that high school kids put around their neck when they go to high school. It wasn't a sign of hope. It was a signal of death. The Romans would crucify people because people would pressure the government and say, look, we're going to nail you to this cross. We're going to put you outside the city. And if you try to press us, this is what's going to happen to you. And so Jesus is saying, look, if you want to follow me, you've got to pick up your cross. And I guarantee you people were looking at him like, you are crazy. Because people pick up their crosses, they would die on the outside of the city. No way, we're not doing that. But what Jesus is saying, he's like, look, if you're going to follow me, you've got to give up everything. You have got to die to yourself so that you can live. He said, you thought you were going to lose everything when you died, but what actually happened is you lived more than you ever could. You found more life. You found more joy. You found more hope. You found purpose. But you have to die so that you can live through me. And here's the deal. I sit on TikTok. (laughs) Went from cross to TikTok. I sit on TikTok all the time. I create on there. It's fun. But what breaks my heart is that I can't tell you how many people I see on videos talking about walking away from the faith. I can't tell you how many people talk about stories of their experiences in the church getting hurt by the church. I can't tell you how many times I see young people go to university and they talk about how their professors taught them the truth, that Jesus is fake, that there's no point, that the church is dying. And let me tell you something, this world needs people who pick up their cross like never before. We need world changers. We need people who will quit playing church. I grew up playing church. I went to church most of my life. We need people who will be the church because this generation needs it. There are kids in this next generation, I'm telling you, the church is getting pressed. But if we keep playing church, we're not going to be the hope that God has called us to be. I promise you. But if we be the church, if we deny ourselves, if we serve, if we love, if we quit worrying about the buildings, that's what I love about this. We quit worrying about the buildings and start worrying about the people out there. That's when hope will take over the city. Are y'all ready for that? Already. But we have to pick up our cross. We have to let it go. We have to quit worrying about the comforts of the world. We got to quit chasing what culture is selling us and chase Christ. It's my prayer for us. My prayer is that every single day, notice that Jesus says, you got to pick up your cross daily. It's not a one time deal. It's not you get baptized and then boom, but <laughs> we get baptized, that's the first step. But then we pick up the cross every single day day. Our heart at Abide is that people who would confess their faith to say, you know what, I'm going to be all in, would be the core, would be the cross holders. doesn't make any sense. Our story at Abide, and I love it, Ron, our founder, moved in the inner city, moved his family. Sorry, I was getting a little loud. Moved his family into the inner city. Loving kids that don't have a dad, a mom. And you, you know what's the saddest part about that story? He got pressed by more churches than anybody. He said, why would you do that? Doesn't that seem ironic? That the people are, who are supposed to be hope carriers are pressing people who are carrying hope. Church, we got to change. We got to see revival. We got to do this thing differently. 
We can't keep doing it the same way. But the church is the hope of the world. My heart is that we would be the hope every day. Let me pray. God, I just thank you, Lord, for a revival. God, I thank you, Lord, that there are hope carriers in this place. God, I, put, I pray with everything that I have, God, we would quit just playing church. And God, that we would be the church. God, that we would live radical. God, that we would see underserved parts of our city and serve them. God, that we would stop finding comfort and money and start giving it away. God, that we would see our neighbors and ask how their day is going. Ask how we can pray for them. That we would throw block parties and reach families that need hope. God, that we would stop pushing our political agendas on people and just start loving people no matter what side they land. God, I pray that we are the hope of the world. God, because you are the hope of the world. God, give us the strength. Give us the courage to lead a revival so that we would be hope, so that we would be the core. God, I pray right now, Lord, if anybody in here feels like a fan, a fan of you, God, I pray that we would make the decision right now, right now, right in this place, that we would be a follower, that we would be like Peter, who said, you're all I need. You're all I got. Lord, we love you. It's in your name.